the Easy Linux Show. This is version 18.9. It's the next episode of Mr. Desktop and Mr. Server. With us today is Jeremy O'Connell from CyberWeb Solutions. How are you today, Jeremy? Oh, I'm doing well, Joe. I'm just getting so many hugs right now. I don't know what to do with them all. <laughs> Uh, he's referring to the fact that yesterday it was announced that the FreeBSD project was banning virtual hugs. And uh, that's been quite the uh, giggle fest uh, since yesterday, uh, finding out about that. Also, by the way, uh, it has been forked to Free Hugs BSD. That's actually up on GitHub if you want to look at it. And for those of you who have no clue what we're talking about, well... I'm sorry. Um, what, did, what date is it anyway? I didn't give the date. Usually I tell them when I'm recording these things. The date would be the 16th of February, 2018. 16th of February. It's Cindy's birthday. Happy birthday to Cindy. Well, so, happy birthday. Yes. Can, is it okay if I pass her a virtual hug? Uh, she's not there to answer, so I don't know. Well, she, she says she's fine with a virtual hug. I asked her that earlier this morning. Okay, well then a virtual hug for her a birthday hug. So Exactly. Okay, so what we're going to talk about in today's lovely little video is this uh, project that that uh, Jeremy has been working on called P-Discs. And it's not really like the world's biggest tool or anything, but I thought it would be fun for him to share it and talk a little bit about it. And I think a lot of you guys would get a kick out of it. And it's, it's, it's less of a... I guess the what? How did you describe it? It's less of a tool than it is an, a thought-provoking project that people can get a hold of, and maybe somebody can. Is, isn't that the way you described it? Was that you could actually expand this into more if you wanted to? We can always expand most things into more, but really, it's just a. The way I describe it, it's really just a wrapper. It's not meant to. It needs the DD command to actually work because it's it's protecting your your data against destruction using the all powerful DD command, because that's something I actually got the idea when I was listening to a podcast and people started mentioning how they've destroyed data. And there's a lot of, well, if you go to forums and you go to things the sites that talk about using server commands and so forth, or even not just server commands, but Linux commands in general, Unix commands, even free BSD, they don't allow hugging, but they do have the DD command that <laughs> it's very easy i know i'm just i'm like brian i just i don't know i just so many people anyway yeah, well, i was I mean, telling joe before okay look, guys, topic, look okay those of you who don't, don't know, know what we're talking hold, hold on a second those of you who don't know what we're talking about go to uh when you get done watching this video go to the search and look for brian lunduke show is it linux thursday the one for yesterday do a search for that and watch uh, Brian Lunduke and Matt Hartley. All you got to do is watch about the first 10 or 15 minutes of it, and you'll, you'll know what we're talking about because we both saw that yesterday and died. It's just so funny. But anyway, okay, continue. P-Discs, sorry. DD is actually what we were talking about. Right, right. And so uh, anyway, so after that little off topic, like I was telling Joe, though, I have to. Did, I did kind of start that. I did go out and get some breakfast, and I was asking people in the restaurant. That, anyway, whatever about the whole virtual <laughs> hugs and what their opinions were, and they were all looking at me like I was an alien for even asking that. But okay, what, to get serious, what P disc is? I was listening to a podcast had nothing to do with hugging or anything like that. And as I said, people were mentioning on there how it's very dangerous to use the the DD command because if you don't know already what that is, that the allows disc you to destroyer. Work with, that's right. And it has no, it's really old. It really has not had any revamp. It doesn't check anything. It just takes what you enter into it and it just accepts that. And it's like, okay, I'll do what you tell me to do. And so it's very easy for people to destroy their data. And one of these stories that was given in there was how someone was trying to write to a USB stick and they overwrote their primary OS and they didn't realize it at first. So, DD's sitting there flashing and it's just happily overriding their main system. Exactly. And so I got to thinking, wait a minute, we can protect that. We can, we can actually make it so, because DD is very useful. But even, for example, someone experienced like myself, I treat DD very carefully. I, I don't usually do much with it because I know that it only takes you're tired or just an accidental inverting of something or you're think you're looking at one partition or disk and for whatever reason, you type a, an A instead of a C or whatever, and we'll explain in a moment, and then there goes your data. So I actually myself don't like using that command. So there are tools out there that you can graphic tools, which are useful, 
but they don't always have all the power of DD. And even they themselves are usually just wrappers for DD in addition. So I said, well, why not create a little utility that I call protect disks is it's to protect your disks and partitions that will actually allow you to get the full benefit of DD without having to risk destroying your OS. So it's a, it's up on GitHub and you can see here at the page at cyberws.com slash bash slash pdisk. Sure, Joe will put a link, but it's, and it takes you on this page where you can download it and go to the GitHub page. But basically you install the utility or you download the utility, I should say, then you put it into your, I recommend your user bin. So let me show you here on this system. If I go to menu here and well, actually let's do this all from the terminal because it's a terminal here. So I'm not even sure what directory I'm in at the moment. Okay, I'm in my home directory. So I recommend that if I ls this, you'll see, well, I don't know why I did it that way. I just do ls this. So I recommend that you put it in the in your user bin. So it'll be slash home slash whatever your user, in my case, developer slash bin, B-I-N. And if it's not there, you just simply create it. And then you, you put pdisk in there. So if I go into the bin directory and I ls this, you'll see here that we have the pdisk file there. So you just download it from GitHub, put it into your, wherever you want to put it into the bin folder directory. Or user local bin. Just, right. Or user local bin if you want everyone to be able to use it. Now, the way it works is that it creates a list of your, it, it goes through and it lists what's your root partition, what's your home partition, and it notes those drives. So PDIS doesn't necessarily protect everything. Well, actually, I should say it will, because the way I wrote PDIS here, hold on, let's go ahead and run this just so you can see it. So if I run PDIS, when you run PDIS for the first time, it says here that it says, okay, connected online drives and partition save to protected device list. And then it will, it says here, as you can see, if you attempted to issue a command, which we didn't, you have to rerun it just by hitting the up arrow. Because the first time PDIS runs is it writes out a list of all your current devices. So when you run it for the first time, you need to remove any USB sticks, any USB drives, if you don't want to have them protected by PDISCs and then build your list, then reconnect your flash drive, reconnect your USB drive, if you don't want to protect them. So let's see, what does that mean? What did it run? Just so you know what's going on, let's take a look at that. Let me get out of the bin directory here by typing in CD space colon, or, well, colon dot dot, excuse me. And then we're going to go into the config directory. So I'm just going to go simply go there. Oh, actually, since I'm already in that directory, and then I'll clear this. And so if I ls this directory here, We'll see here that in the dot config directory, we've created a p. It's created a p disks. Now I don't really want to get into. There's there's documentation if you want to read all the specifics here, but I'll just show you what it what it has done here, just so you can see this because you might want to edit this yourself. So I've cd'd into p disks. Well, let me clear that first. And now if I ls this, we have a config file and a version ts file. This is something new on uh, everything I'm programming now. I'm creating a version ts file. And it will go and let you know after 60 days, hey, you might want to check for a new version. So, by the way, if you're using C uh, CYA or Connect SSH, I would recommend you update those because they now have version checks in there. And CYA actually has some new features in there as well. Anyway, back to PDISCs. So if I, for example, VI this config file, then you'll see here it has created a list of the drives that are created. So you can see here slash dev slash SDA along with all the active partitions and then slash dev slash sdb and then all the partitions there so that's what i was saying it when it first run for the very first time any drive that's connected whether like i said it's it's an external drive like a usb stick or a usb external drive or an internal drive or doesn't matter it's going to make this s dev list and those devices and partitions and drives become protected. That means PDISC will not allow you to issue commands to those devices. For example, let's let me quit here. And so how do you use PDISC? There's there's help in here and everything. So if I go to PDISC's help, we get a list here. And I'm not going to go over all, all this. You can this is just a quick little rundown. This is not the most thorough on how to use this. But what I would do here is if I wanted to write out, 
with PDIS is start using DD. So if you go look up documentation online, wherever you see DD, just start thinking, remove DD and put in PDISCs as the leading argument there. So if I go to say, for example, PDISCs and I go, let's say the input file will be dev slash zero. And then let's mm -hmm. say I do an output file of say dev slash SDA. Now, if, well, let's go one even. If I issued this when DD, it is going to immediately overwrite my dev SDA one partition. Which is where your and operating my, system is installed. Which is where my operating system is. So let's go ahead and issue this. Look, it says aborting protected drive partition dangerous, not allowed. So that means if I were say, for example, I was kind of tired. I, I just downloaded an ISO or something. I'm like, okay, for Ubuntu 1804 or something. And I want to burn this to a flash drive or whatever. And I'm, like I said, I'm tired. I'm not thinking. I say, go ahead and write this to a device. Say, I, I, mean, I meant to go put it as SDC because that was where the my actual flash drive was. But I'm just not thinking. Just type it. Type in SDA. And I hit mm -hmm. enter. And it won't allow me to write to that drive. It's protected my operating system. If instead here I had used DD, oh, DD would be off and running and be writing zeros to my primary exactly. drive. Exactly. And it, it so wouldn't this take is a protection. It'll Go be ahead. gone. <laughs> I was just going to say it wouldn't take more than a. You couldn't even clear out of it because even even when it starts, the first thing it uh, first thing it blows off is the bootloader. So yeah, bye. there's there's some scenarios scenarios and everything where, uh, and again, yeah, so you saw the list where you can simply go in this in this directory here, if I want to edit the config file, I can add devices, remove devices or whatever. But I also thought about, well, what happens if I, if you want to write out, say, for example, you really do want to destroy your, your main disks, like maybe you're getting ready to reinstall the OS. I thought about putting an overwrite command. And then I thought, you know what, if you really need to destroy your primary partitions, just use DD in that exactly. case. But for every, it, for everything else, use P disks. If you get in the habit of using P disks, and again, whatever documentation you see online, just replace the DD in front because online it will say like DD space, whatever. You type in P disks. But see, DD, for example, if you enter in nothing, it'll just, sit, if I just sit, hit enter, it'll just sit there and run and run and run. And it's not doing anything. But in P disks, as you saw, if I, well, I didn't, sorry, I didn't, if I issue P disks, you can see here that it says you need to enter both an, an input file and an output file. So the same happens with PDISCs if I just enter in, say, an input file of, say, dev zeros or zero, and I leave off the output file, whereas DD doesn't really say anything. It just kind of accepts it and just is the only time DD will say anything is if it you, you put in a, d a drive that doesn't exist or a device. If you say try and, say, use an input file of, Da dash dev dash zero one, which doesn't exist, it DD will then actually say something. So I also put in these little fly or these little messages where PDIS is like, hey, I can't do that. So what PDIS does is it takes your input, sanitizes it, checks it, makes sure it's okay, and then passes all it does is then it passes the info the command off to to DD to do it. So this way, by using PDIS, it is safe to use the DD command. For the most part, there's a little caveat because you can, for internal drives, you're fine. For external drives and flash drives, it depends. Because, for example, let's say you have two internal hard drives. So you have dev SDA and dev SDB, and then you have a protected flash drive that you maybe you keep a flash drive connected most of the time, and that's dev SDC. If, if you take that flash drive out, so SD dev SDC is gone, and then you plug in an external USB hard drive that then gets reassigned to dev SDC. Then you plug in your say favorites or whatever flash drive. Now that flash drive was dev SDC. Now it's become SDD. It is no longer protected. So in theory, you could overwrite that if you're not paying attention. So removable media, it depends. It's really, this is, PDISC is really more about protecting, always connected, always on. Now, if you have an external drive that just pretty much is on all the time, then you're fine. If you just have an external drive, like I said, this dev SDB on your system, and it's just, it just comes on when your computer comes on, just because you, whatever reason, there's a lot of people who like writing to the, the that scenario, that's fine. But 
I uh, again look at it more as an internal internal setup. So that's really all there is to PDIS. I mean, there's a little bit more, but I think that's we don't need to spend 30, 40 minutes on PDIS. There's there's the help documentation and Joe can put a link to it. But as I said, don't forget there are updates to connect to SSH and CYA. Make sure you grab those because there are some features and putting the version you, check. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just put a I'll put a link to the Cyberweb Solutions software page. And that way you can you can navigate to it from there, right? Yeah. I mean if you go well here, let me go if you go on here, Cyber Web Solutions over here, well, it's in the it's in the software too, but under under Bash Utilities, you, you can go here and there's just a quick link to all four projects. So right now, but anyway, so that's PDIS. I mean, I don't really think there's a whole lot more to go over. Again, I don't really want to turn no, it into they, a well, they, the the other thing is the the thing is, is to talk a little bit about how that version checker works. Okay, the version checker is. Let's see. Let me call back up my terminal here. Since we're in here. I will just, if I LS this here, you'll see there's a version checker. And again, this has been added to CYA and connect to SSH and PDISCs. And what it does is if I catch that version, is it simply a Unix timestamp of when it ran. And then what happens is every time you use the software, it checks. Once it's gone past 60 days of, of you not checking the version, it just displays a little, hey, you haven't checked the, the version. Here, in fact, I'll show you what it does. So let me let me VI this and we'll change this to say we'll put in say a well, let me insert say a three. Well, I didn't mean that many threes. Okay. Three threes here. Okay. So here I have now changed it so it is not it is now past 60 days. So when I go to run PDISCs again, say I go run PDIS help, it will say oh, no, I'm okay. I didn't do that. I sorry since I messed up the Let's see. I think I have one too many numbers in there. That was the problem. It was still greater than 60 days. So now if I try and run PDIS help, it then stops and says, whoa, your version could be out of date. Could be. You haven't checked in 60 days. Would you like to check for a new version? Now, mm -hmm. if you answer yes, what it does is it just runs PDIS space version. Or if you're on CYA, it does CYA space version behind the scenes for you. If you answer no, then all it does is it just continues on with the program. And again, CYA and Connect SSH work the same way. However, regardless whether you answer yes or no, it's going to, and the default is yes, why? So it's going to still update the version file behind there. So it's not nagging you. It's not, it's not nagging you every time you run it. It'll just remind you, gently remind you once 60 days has passed. I mean, obviously, if you haven't run it for 120 days, then it will say, hey, it's been past 60 days. So for example, if I answer why, then it's saying, okay, it's checking and it says, oh, you have the latest version. Now, if I run it again, you'll see here, we don't get that, we don't get that pause. But mm -hmm. even if I go back to the version here and I change this back to say, I go to, three, I keep inserting an extra three for some reason. Anyway, if I go run this again and then we get out of date, if I answer no, it continues on. And then if I do it again, it's still not nagging me. So I didn't want it to be in your face, constantly nagging you, but I wanted a general reminder that, hey, there could be a new version out there. Maybe you're running a version that's a year old or six months old and there's some bug that's been fixed and you have forgotten to do P disks say version you haven't run that yourself so that's all it is awesome well I, I was just wondering you know for those out there who wanted to see what the mechanics were like that you know just how did how did that actually go do that that's awesome so there you go that's about p disks and of course uh jeremy is a very good friend of the easy linux project and he is responsible for the construction of the easy linux page and if you Go to that page, you know, easylinux.com, look at the bottom. You'll see there's a link there to CyberWeb Solutions. So we have a lot of uh, respect for what he does around here. That is definitely true. And we were trying to figure out what we were going to talk about. I think the one thing that I wanted, besides virtual hugs, uh, was that, you know, I, <laughs> I wanted to talk That's a little bit about what? That's just, I just, you know, whatever. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, we were t talking about just the, the, uh, this morning, um, I ran across a video by Matt Hartley, which I actually shared on the Easy Linux Facebook page, where he took a look at MX17, which is a distribution of Linux that's based on Debian. 
And so I actually installed that this morning in a virtual machine and played with it. And it, it was really quite good. Also in the last couple of weeks, let's see, I've looked at elementary, I've looked at KDE Neon, I've looked at the, the alpha for Ubuntu 18.04. I've heard nothing but really good things that are coming along for Ubuntu Mate 18.04. And uh, it, it just seems to me that just all the way around, Linux is getting better. And it's amazing how far we have come in, in just the, you know, a couple of years since Ubuntu 1604 was released. And I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on what you're seeing, you know, because he works with a lot of people in enterprise space. What I do with the Easy Linux project is try and get people started on the desktop, you know, that want to use a computer at home, maybe a really small business application. But uh, Jeremy works with folks in the enterprise space. And I wanted to get your take on the future here where, you know, when 1804 comes along, how do you think that's going to affect people in enterprise? Do you think there's going to be more adoption? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, with anything business related, obviously businesses, well, I should say obviously, but if you're a home user, you might not know businesses move a lot slower. So in general, home users and enthusiasts, developers will jump on brand new versions to test them out, to use them, to take advantage of new features. Business, however, is very slow because if something's working, businesses generally don't want to change it up. There's always that risk something won't go right, some software won't work. So it often takes a year, two, or three to get onto a new platform as a business. Some businesses could be five, six years down the road. So I don't expect, at least for most businesses, to adopt 1804 and all the children of 1804 and everything that comes out around centered around 1804. I don't expect businesses, most businesses to jump on board immediately. If there's a new server that's being rolled out or something, that's generally where I see the adoption. But I don't really have a rush of clients saying, hey, 1804 is out. We're running 1604 or 1404. Can you upgrade our server today? It, it just doesn't work that way. Because again, as long as things are working on a website, on a database server, it's generally like, don't mess with it. <laughs> don't mess with it. It's it's working. But as again, new servers roll out as it's time to upgrade a physical hardware, or if a lot of the clients I maintain are on things like DigitalOcean, Voltaire, things like that, hosted solutions or have dedicated co-location stuff, then that's when I'll see it. So I personally am very excited for 18.04. But also, again, with our company, I'm not going to rush out and, well, we don't run except for one server right now. Well, backup servers, it's more than one server, come to think of it. But all our web stuff is still, if you're interacting as a client, like CyberWeb is all using CentOS. And I've been kind of toying with the idea of potentially getting off CentOS, although I still like the long support cycle of 10 years. Mm -hmm. If Ubuntu would bump that up to 10 years, I would probably move us off. But even there, even if Ubuntu said, okay, 1804 server, we're going to support that for 10 years or eight years, I'm not going to upgrade our sites immediately and our database servers and all that. It's it's a slow, slow, slow process on the business side. Do I'm excited expect, for 1804. Yeah, but I mean, do you expect a lot of people, let's say that, I mean, I'm sure you've had clients that are sitting on 1604 server or 1604, some sort of spin of Ubuntu. Do you think that uh, they will sit there for, for much longer? Because, you know, the, the biggest, the first question that I get asked every single time, a new version of Ubuntu or Linux Mint comes along is should I upgrade? And, you know, in the enterprise space, you know, you were talking about how things move very, very slow. So, I mean, do you think a lot of people will just sit on 1604 and maybe open up backports or, or what? Yes. I don't, I don't see any, there's no indication that anyone is going, and I myself for my primary desktop will not immediately upgrade to 1804 for, at least two to three months, maybe even more towards fall, because I I need something that I'm encouraged by what's going into 1804. I think it's going to be a great release. There's a lot of promise. And of course, obviously, for development reasons, we need new new features, new ideas going into it. That's all, all well, very important. We have to have that. However, from the, from the business standpoint, things have to work and things have to right. work reliably. And so, uh, for example, I in 1604, Go ahead. And well, 1604 broke the wireless and there was all this problem with wireless. So it's it was working great in beta. 
1604 comes out, you know, this big storm comes up about wireless in a business. You can't be having, uh, for example, I, I maintain some pies for doctor's office, chiropractor, stuff like that, that have the display that run the display systems that when you come in and you're greeted and it's, it's, it's rotating there as you're in the little waiting room, uh, not the private waiting room, but the, the, you're sitting there waiting and filling out your insurance forms or whatever. And you have, you have stuff there. I can't load it, you know, 1604 when it came out, having that on there and suddenly dropping wireless connections and not getting updates and stuff, not going to be good for business. The, the clients are so it's going to take some time to get those clients. They're not in any hurry to get off 1604 because it's working, it's stable. And it may be honestly a year or two before I get them onto 1604. I mean, sorry, off 1604 onto 1804 because there's no, there's no reason, right? There's nothing that they need right now that is not being met by 1604. There's, I can't think of any client right now that's saying, oh, gee, I need to do this. And, and I'm telling him, well, 1604 or CentOS or something like that isn't meeting, isn't meeting. And I know this is 1804, but obviously what Ubuntu does, Red Hat watches and vice versa. So I really don't, I can't think of anything in the business space. And there has to be a compelling reason for businesses. Cause again, they're very slow. They're mm -hmm. very, very slow to update because they're so concerned about breaking something. Well, one of the things that what I was going to say earlier was is that canonical, um, uh, they they're not even going to offer an upgrade to 1804 to anyone who's running 1604 until 1804.1 is released so that i mean you won't you know you're not going to see it come up in your update manager that it's going to automatically say hey do you want to upgrade that will happen when they release 1804.1 which is the first dot release and and i think that's a pretty smart idea they're not going to last time around when we went to four, from 1404 to 1604 they offered it straight up front and then a lot of people got burnt because of the the wi-fi issue so uh, maybe they're taking a little slower i'm actually more concerned about uh, the shock that people are going to have if you happen to be running ubuntu in an enterprise setting or at home and you're used to using unity 7 and all of a sudden you're going to be thrown into the new ubuntu gnome world which is uh, they've done a lot to try and make it look the same but it's it's a very different environment so that's going to be interesting to see how people react to that and uh, I, I think unity 7 is actually going to be available for 1804 that's what i have heard I haven't heard any uh, details about that i think they're actually going to have a spin of it that's going to be ubuntu unity so uh, or at least that might happen somewhere down the road just to to you know not shock people of course for people like um you know, uh, Jeremy loves Ubuntu Mate, and we do too. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we're all into Linux Mint around here because uh, it's really the, you know, one of the better ones for people to start out with. But the second choice for me has always been Ubuntu Mate, and that's his first choice. And there's some really good stuff coming up on that one. And um, so, you know, the, the Mate desktop is the, that would be the one that uh, is going to be the most interesting to see what changes. And there's a lot of controversy about, yeah, go on. But I was going to say, there's a lot of controversy about GNOME right now. Anyway, we could get into that if you want to, but uh, those yeah, of you who I mean, are on Mate. It, exactly. I mean, it, as Joe just said, I, I'm definitely for a desktop. Mate is by far the number one choice and then everything else is distant, but I, I run a Mate on everything I have, personal and, and every desktop I've set up for any client or family member or friend on Linux has been 100%, 100% Ubuntu Mate. I've not set up anything else. And thus far, I've heard of very little issues. And more often than not, it's related to an app and doesn't really have a whole lot to, I, to do with you know, this is, But this is a question I'm not going to update I'm... myself. I can't update. I got it. On my systems, I need them to work. So I'm glad that Ubuntu is waiting to the dot one release to come out. So 1804.1, that's when I will personally upgrade. I'm not going to even upgrade any of my systems until then. I want it to come out so people can start testing it. And if you're going to be a tester, I appreciate you being a guinea pig for me. So thank you. You know, Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the question that I have to ask, and then we're going to have to wrap this up, is just when you set up Ubuntu Mate for clients, and let's assume that they're coming from a Windows-ish environment. 
how do you lay out the desktop for them? Do you just give them the the vanilla Ubuntu Mate layout, or do you like go through and like and do Redmond or something like that? What do you do? Well, actually, I generally show them a, a, an option. I usually, if someone in the company, I show what it can do, and then I let them decide. But honestly, most people seem to be fine with the general layout or even the advanced layout. Because here I have the advanced layout. So if I click on menu here, I, it, mm -hmm. I generally show them this this menu. And even if they're used to Windows, I mean, this is very similar to, and some of them want it on the bottom. And so fine, I put it down here or whatever. And sometimes I eliminate the the extra bar here. On my personal system, I just use the, the default settings, except I use the advanced menu. I don't like the three separate. But even with this, this is very Windows 7-ish because you have, I mean, it's slightly reversed, but you have like on, on Windows, you'd have the start button coming up here. Or, and I don't call it that anymore, I know, but but they have the Windows button or whatever. And you click on that and then you have programs like all programs here and you get a list of them um, and shortcuts would be up here. And then you get like my compu well, computer now and I'm so used to XP, but you get computer and all that over on this side. So this is very, very similar to that setup. And uh, even coming from the Windows world, they're, they sit down and they're, they're not all of a sudden, I've never really had anyone go like, what? I mean, the biggest thing is just to have to get used to the application. So, you know, and some clients don't want to run, they want to run Windows and okay. And some clients just, they just have Windows for their systems. And, and in fact, a lot of the, chiropractors, doctor's offices, honestly, are still on Windows. And then they have things like Raspberry Pi servers that are not, but some of them are like, well, we have to use QuickBooks. And I'm like, you can use it online. And they're like, no, we need to use QuickBooks here locally. And they're using a really old version. I'm like, you need to upgrade. And they're like, no, we don't want to go through that. And I'm like, okay. Because they're like, it's, it's maybe 10 years old, but it works for our business. And I'm like, okay, you could do that in a virtual machine. And some of them are like, nah. So yeah, but I'm not a big a, fan. You, yeah, but you've got the servers and things and the displays and everything. So it's it's coming in around the edges. And when the Windows machines blow up, there you go. Well, yeah, <laughs> and honestly, a lot of the, exactly. But a lot of those clients are, are smaller businesses that run old, old machines. I mean, a lot of those machines are 10, some of them 15 years old. And so they just, it works for them. And despite that, they're not getting lots of, I, I mean, I tell them you're not getting the most updates and stuff. And it's hard because a lot of, a lot of people just don't, see they're like so it works and and at the end of the day matt hartley's talked about this unless there's some pain point or something they need if it's working for them they're going to be even windows i mean i, I know of companies that are still running xp and i'm like you need to get off xp and they're like well i like all my software and it's you know three people or whatever and they're like mm -hmm. they're like just maintain our website and stuff but I, we're fine with xp and i keep telling them you're not they're like, but everything works and we're not really using the internet much we just need to use this really old version of quickbooks and this patient software we have and i'm like it doesn't and whatever so i'm like okay and I, I can obviously only do so much. And so you still, internet statistics still show that you will see 20, 30% of the internet is using at, at Windows XP. And it's, it, unless there's something that is super compelling, the pain has to be there often, but not even a little bit of pain. It has to be overwhelming pain to get people to move. And I've run into that myself. So, but oh, back like, to your I, question. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, just back to your question. I generally have found most people are fine with the layout. Even a lot of Windows users that are used to the start button being, well, again, I know it's not start button, but the Windows button being in this lower left-hand corner, a lot of them are like, I, I tell them I can move it down. And they're like, yeah, fine. It's it's fine if it's up there. Some people get a little bit upset or cranky that it's not there. And I'm like, fine, we can move it. It's no problem. I, I'm just surprised you're not automatically putting them on the mutiny layout. I mean, you know, that would be the first one, my choice. <laughs> 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 you know the one yeah, that's well, supposed I to mean, kind of look like unity there you go that's the one to use <laughs> exactly but i have yet to honestly all the desktops like i said are all mate and my hat's off to to martin wimpress he's done he and his team have done a, a really good job but if you, you're using mint i'm not here to bash mint like some people it 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 works and i have used mint in the past in fact three or four years ago i had a mint powered when i wasn't using well, I did a lot with Linux servers have for a while, but I still was on Windows 7. I know, I know. But I I was actually had a laptop that I had converted from Windows 7 over to Mint. And because I got tired of all the Windows 7 nonsense. So I used Mint, oh gosh, I think it was maybe 14, I want to say. I don't remember now, but I have nothing against Mint 
per se. I just am in the Mate. Camp, no, you're just so. no, you're just you're just you're just a fan. I don't uh, I don't hold against anybody to use anything. Um, but well, I'm um, the same way. I'm like some people that really whatever bash. works for you, man. Go ahead, knock it yourself out, have a good time. You know. And you know? I don't understand this hate for Canonical. I mean, no company's perfect. They've made some missteps, but the Linux desktop would not be where it is today without Canonical, period. So you can dump on Canonical all you want. You can say they're a horrible company or they're, they're Microsoft or whatever. And sorry, I'm, you're not going to find me in that camp because Canonical has put in with their team and their teams just hundreds of millions of dollars, really billions if you calculate it, of development. And no other point to another company that has done that. The only other company that's put in that level of development is Red Hat, but they're doing it for the server. So name another company that has that. I mean, when you sit, when you really think about it, almost the vast majority of desktops are Ubuntu or Ubuntu derivatives, whether they're Mint, Ubuntu Mate, Subuntu, whatever. Mm, yep, yep. So bash Canonical all you want, but the Linux desktop would not be where it is today without Canonical. Period. Okay, and on that note. <laughs> <laughs> you can have fun in the comments with that. Look, it's really cool anytime Jeremy comes and hangs around and we're going to have to do this uh, more often. And so if you have any suggestions, stuff that you'd like to hear us talk about, then, you know, get, you know, give me some feedback, uh, go to uh, easylinux.com and go to the contact us page and go to feedback there or put something in the comments here for this video. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to, even though we're doing the Easy Linux show, we're still going to continue with occasional Mr. Servers and Mr. Desktops. And if you'd like to find out more about what Jeremy is into, go to cyberwebsolutions.com. There will be a link in the description for this video. And also check out Easy Linux on the web. Check out Easy Linux on Facebook and check out freedompenguin.com for lots of cool stories about Linux. All of those links are in the description. Check out PDISCs if that's something that you're interested in playing around with as well. And any final thoughts, Jeremy, before we say bye-bye? Well, I think we pretty much covered it. I I'm open to doing, especially if you want to get more frequently with just doing a 30-minute recording here or there that's more or less answering questions or just comments. I mean, that's not as involved as a two hour thing on. Oh CYA. yeah. You know, yeah. Those we've, we've done some legendarily long ones here when we get into like doing whole projects and stuff like that. So we're going to try and shorten it up just a little bit. I think this one's going to run about 35 minutes before we decide right. done. So, and we could do more of these. I'm open to doing more of these more often, more frequently. So that's all yeah. I'll have to say. So goodbye community. And remember hugs. Yeah. Virtual hugs. Virtual <laughs> hugs right back at you. <laughs> All right, we'll do it again soon.